right. This is one of the benefits of going straight through the Bible is we don't skip anything, even the uncomfortable parts. So this morning is one of those uncomfortable parts. So, but before I start, Brendan and Olga are right over there and they just got married. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Congrats, guys. The new couple. We're excited for you guys. So this is the message for you today, husbands and wives, okay? This is what he asked to have, so I was like, okay, I'll do it, man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so when Marianne and I were younger, we used to play a lot of games with our friends. You know, those days before kids came around when you would stay up till way too late and get way too silly because you're way too tired and just play games together. You know, those days go away after you have kids and get busy and stuff like that. But there was a game we used to play where there were no rules to the game that were spoken. So you start playing the game and you have to learn the rules as you go along. And so every time somebody would then deal, they had the opportunity to make up a brand new rule that they knew of and nobody else did. And the only way that you discover the rule is through trial and error. Every time you, you know, have to draw four more cards because you did the wrong thing, you start learning after a while, well, okay, well, well, what did I do wrong, you know? And um, it just kind of reminds me that that card game brought to memory sometimes what it feels like when you go to church. Because you're wondering, what are the rules around here? Like, what's acceptable and what is not? If you're not familiar with the community, there, there are some natural rules that you can pretty much guess, you know, just not, you know, to distract everybody or, you know, stand up and squawk like a chicken. That would be really weird. Um, but there are unspoken rules that we have oftentimes in the church setting that you kind of learn as you go along. Visiting a new church could really feel like that. I remember a time when I visited a Catholic church with one of my friends, and I had, you know, I wasn't really used to anything Catholic. So when we went in and, and they dipped their fingers in the water, when they first came in, I was like, okay, you know, they did the thing. And I was like, okay, I'm not sure how to do that. So I'm just following them in, into the room. And then they kneel in front of the aisle and go have their seat. And I just follow them in. And throughout the service, you know, there's the the standing and the sitting and the kneeling and the repeating. And then there was communion and they're like, no, you can't do this because you're not Catholic. So I had to sit in my seat and, and wait for everybody and feel awkward. And so anyway, you know, it was really strange because I wasn't familiar with the traditions. I wasn't familiar with the way they did things. But there's meaning behind all of it. And in everything, in every church, there are traditions or things that we do that have meaning behind it. Communion is one of those. It has a really deep meaning to it. Um, but there are a lot of other things that we do that perhaps we don't know why we do them. It's just tradition. We just have done it this way for so long. Now, in this passage, we're going to see one of those traditions, one of those things that was practiced that might seem very strange if you showed up to the church in Corinth and wondered what was going on. Um, but as you probably have already figured out, we don't take this passage in the literal sense or else we would be handing out head coverings at the door instead of communion cups, right? But the overarching principle that we're going to see throughout this whole passage is this, propriety in worship. And so this word propriety means the state or quality of conforming to conventionally accepted standards of behavior and morals. You know, just the way the community functions. If you're part of any community, you kind of make this agreement, oftentimes unspoken, that you will go along with the way things um, are to be part of the community in order to function in that community. So that's what Paul is doing here. He's setting up the rules. He's just saying it straight out. This is what we do, and this is why we do it. And so at this point in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, there's a shift in the focus. You know, from chapters 8 through 10, Paul talked about exercising our rights and liberties as Christians in the world. You know, like outside the doors of the church. How do we 
um, practice our Christianity in those gray areas that we may have freedom, but it might not always be good for us, you know? And so how he's concerned about the gospel witness, he's concerned about weaker brothers following bad examples. So we went through all of that. But chapters 11 through 14 deal with the rights and liberties within the church. And so he was talking about things happening outside. Now he's talking about things happening within. Um, The practice of worship together. And so he deals with, between chapters 11 and 14, head coverings, communion, spiritual gifts, prophecies, tongues, and orderly worship. So we got a lot of interesting topics ahead of us, um, and many of them controversial. So hopefully you find that fun. But the church needs order. When it comes to worship, we need some sort of order, some sort of agreed upon way of doing things. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, we see this principle. It says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, you know, and so he goes on, but making that reality that God wants order. He created the universe with order, and therefore the church also functions with order. We need order in worship and in our relationship with God and in our relationships with one another in in our own households as well as the household of God. So the first thing we're looking at here regarding propriety in worship is propriety from observing order in authority. Verse 2, it says, Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. You know, it's always a good practice before you talk to somebody about something they're doing wrong to, like, encourage them with what they're doing right. You know, you ever do this with your kids or with an employee or something? You, you go over the things they're doing well, and then you can bring in the things that they need to work on. And it communicates that you care about them, that you do notice when they do things right, not just when they mess up. And then you can get into the issues at hand. And so Paul now talks about the things they're doing right. You guys are following my example. You're doing great. Um, But they have some failures. So he's about to point these out. But in doing it this way, again, he's saying, I care about your success as well. So one of the things they're doing right is that they remember Paul and everything. They followed Paul's instruction because he was an apostle, number one, but he was also the guy that planted the church in Corinth. And so he set up the church in the order of worship and everything else for the believers. And the last verse we saw was 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1 where he said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so he points out, you know, I could see you following my example as I follow the example of Christ, and I I like what I see. And then he says that they maintain the traditions. They maintain the traditions. The oral instructions concerning worship in the setting of church. And so this word traditions means this. It carries the idea of something that's handed down to you from a mentor, previous generation. Paul's specific instruction here, specifically it's Paul's specific instruction he handed down to the Corinthians concerning worship. And so the traditions that they practiced on Sunday morning when they got together. Spiro Zodiades says in his word dictionary for the Greek language, a tradition doctrine or injunction delivered or communicated from one to another with divine or human, and I think it's supposed to be authority there, but uh, the Pharisees delivered to the people by tradition of their ancestors many injunctions which were not written in the law of Moses. For this reason, the secret of, or the sect, sorry, of the Sadducees rejected them saying that it was not written, uh, what was not written should be not esteemed as obligatory, but that which came from oral tradition need not to be observed. So um, you can see that tradition has always been an issue in religious communities um, where some people 
observe the same traditions and some people do not. In Mark 7, 8, we see this same word used when Jesus confronts the Pharisees. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And so he was confronting them for putting their traditions before the scriptures, when it should be the other way around, where scriptures come first, doctrine sets the foundation, and then tradition flows from the truth, not the other way around. And so that's always been a uh, sticking point for many is that they get connected to the tradition and forget about the scripture that gave birth to the idea of that tradition. So the practice of head coverings was a tradition with a purpose. There was a truth behind it. But it was implemented in a way that made sense for its time and culture. So the scriptures do not change. The doctrine that we believe does not change. No matter what time you're in, no matter what culture you're in, the teaching of scripture stands true. But our practice or tradition can change in different times and cultures. Some Christians right now are practicing Lent. Some of you, when I say that, you're like, what is that? That's the stuff I have in my belly button, you know? (laughs) I didn't grow up practicing Lent, so I make fun of it, but, you know, uh, other people see it as very, very holy. And um, for 40 days, they practice um, abstaining from something, you know, and observing um, kind of a repentance, a sorrow for their sin, and until... It comes to Easter and so on. And so many of you, maybe some of you guys are practicing it right now, and it means something to you. But we don't find in Scripture Lent being commanded of every believer, and that's why some practice it, some don't. Um, But Paul had delivered a specific tradition to the people. But one of the ideas that I like to ponder when it comes to to tradition is was it handed down by man or was it handed down by God? Because the, the traditions that are handed down by man really are just that. But the ones that are instituted by God, we ought to stand up and take notice. You know, we ought to really uh, focus on those traditions. So concerning communion, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, just a little bit later from here, right here, Paul says, I delivered these things to you, but concerning communion, he said this, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. And so communion is not just some man's made tradition. It was handed down to us by Christ and therefore should be practiced by his followers even today, no matter what time that we exist in, no matter what culture we are part of. But Paul doesn't say the same about head covering. Now, a general rule of knowing which practices to adopt today would be this. This this is kind of a general rule of knowing what traditions should we be practicing today or what traditions are we free to practice, and um, it doesn't matter as long as we do it for the right reasons. Um, Number one, if a tradition is taught by Jesus, take note. Number two, if it's practiced in the book of Acts, You can see it practiced in the church. And number three, that it's taught about by the apostles. So those three things being true would make a tradition something that we should carry on even today. And there are two huge traditions that we see meeting all three criteria, and that is communion and baptism. Those are the two sacraments, if you will, that Christ instituted and have passed down to the church. When it comes to all the other traditions, there is freedom and there is liberty. From here, Paul will take the tradition he set in place and he gives a theological framework to support the idea behind his tradition that he instituted. So understand, you know, with any tradition, you should have a good reason for doing it. And as Paul said in other places, Let everyone be fully convinced in their own mind. 
tradition we have today that not everybody follows, but many Christians do, is Christmas time. You know, we know Jesus wasn't born on, on Christmas, <laughs> you know, but we still celebrate his birth on that day. You know, it's a tradition that could go by the wayside, but it doesn't change our faith. It doesn't change the doctrine. Um, but if we practice it, you know, you have the freedom to do, do, do so. So be fully convinced in your own mind. So Paul is about to bring both doctrine and practice into this discussion. The skill is having the wisdom to discern between the two. So what I, I would love to see at the end of this passage is for us to take to heart the doctrine, the truths that are to be held on to no matter what age you're a part of, no matter what culture you live in. And so in verse three, he lays down a principle here. He says, but I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a wife is her husband and the head of Christ is God. You know, the Bible offers a really different narrative than the narrative that the world offers us today. It's a totally different story than what the world presents for us today. And that is why it seems so different. There is a God-ordained order to the universe because he is creator. And so everything has purpose. Everything has meaning. One of the things that we see in God's created order is the principle of headship or hierarchy or um, structure. And so Paul uses this word head to refer to that. This word head obviously literally means the actual head of a person, but figuratively, it means a, a person who has the authority over another. Okay? So if someone is your head, that means they have authority over you. So Christ is called the head of the church. And here we see Paul set up an orderly row of order where we fit in and where God fits in. And so he says, you know, there's God the Father, who is the head of Christ, the Son, who is head of the husband, who is head of his wife. And so keep in your minds that the context of this was, is within marriage, within the family. Um, those who are unmarried do not fall under the same order. Like if you're dating, your boyfriend is not your head, ladies. <laughs> um, God is. And so when you enter the marriage covenant, though, you enter into this order that God has set up so that things run smoothly, so that they follow his created um, hierarchy, if you will. But authority, and this is really important, authority does not establish value. This is what the leaders of the world often get wrong. They, they see themselves as elite, as better than the average person. So one that has authority in God's kingdom serves those they have authority over. They don't lord it over them. Even Jesus said, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so authority does not establish, establish value. In the same way that God, the Father, and the Son are equal in the Trinity, as well as the Spirit, so is husband and wife. They are equal. The same value. But just like in the Trinity, where the Father, the Son, and the Spirit all have different roles, so in the marriage, the husband and wife have different roles. Now, Christ submitted himself to the Father's will. And when he came to this earth, he, he set aside the independent use of his divine attributes in order to walk in the will of the Father and to do things in the power of the Spirit. And so, in a sense, he walked in the way we are to walk, you know? He set us, for us the example. But notice how he, he submitted to the Father. He was sent by the Father, and he followed the Father's will. And so, if there's need for order, 
in the Godhead, and we see it being implemented by Jesus, our Lord, how much more in a marriage relationship? How much more in a family? And how much more in a church? So, husbands, you are to submit to Christ above all things. The issue was not who is more spiritual, because sometimes if we answer that question, husbands have to admit, my wife is way more spiritual than I am. But it's an issue of what has God called you to do? God's divine order. Use your authority to serve your wife. In 1 Peter 3, 7, we see how serious this is. It says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. You see how serious that is? If you're God's representative in your home and you're messing that up, your prayers can be hindered. In Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Man, that's a big calling. Are you loving your wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So we see Jesus does that with the church, and husbands are to do that in their home, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And just in case, you know, guys, you think of yourself too much, (laughs) as we do sometimes, I love how the Bible calls the church God's bride. You know, so when it really comes down to it, manly man, you're the bride of Christ. How does that make you feel? (laughs) So you submit to him. Um, The whole church does. Husbands and wives, men and women. But wives, when you get married and you enter into a covenant relationship before God, you place yourself in that order that God said in the marriage relationship. And so you put yourself under your husband's headship. And you, in a sense, follow the example of Christ, who is equal with the Father, yet submits to his will. And in the same way, being equal with your husband, though God might lead the home through him, you follow his lead. And that's tough. Man, that's tough. But so is loving your wife the way Christ loved the church. So each of us are called to a tough task, no matter what side of the coin you're on. But you're not to become helpless or weak as a woman. You're not to be a servant confined to the home, so to speak. When you look at the powerful picture of the godly woman in Scripture, you see a very different story. In Proverbs 31, when we see the Proverbs 31 woman, you know, I I love this picture of her because it goes against everything that the world thinks this means. It says, she rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Women are not to be weak pushovers. You're called to be strong, godly women that reflect the character and nature of Christ. And so when we look at, and there's a lot in Psalm, or, uh, Proverbs 31, so I'd encourage you to check that out. But when we look at Sarah's example, one of the preeminent examples of a godly woman in Scripture, um, who submitted to her husband, and this is really uncomfortable, she called him master. Okay, that was really weird, but First Peter tells us that. Yet Sarah wasn't a pushover. If you read her story, you know um, that after Abraham conceives of a son with Sarah's um, maidservant, um, Ishmael, the son of, of that relationship, as well as Hagar, the maidservant, uh, begin kind of stirring up issues in the home and causing problems. That's why God never created um, marriage to be polygamous. (laughs) But 
Sarah's like, get him out of here. And that was hard for Abraham to hear. But in Genesis 21, 12, but God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. Ouch. For through Isaac, your offspring will be named. So God had a plan. But notice that. Listen to your wife. She's right. There are times when we have to do that. And there are plenty of times when I've learned that lesson. Um, but notice how she had a say in what was going on. So anyway, there's a lot we can talk about with regards to roles of husbands and wives and how God set order up in the home. But one of the great things we see about Jesus and about the scriptures is that God gives women value and dignity not found in most culture, cultures. And especially of that time, in the Middle East or the Greco-Roman world, women um, were treated more like property. It was really a sad reality for women in that day. What we find in Scripture might seem strange to us today, but it was actually quite revolutionary to mankind in that day and age. And so we find in it a lot of the foundational ideas that brings women freedom, even today, from the tyranny of godless men, you know, bringing them under the righteous rule of Christ instead. Well, in verse 4, every man who prays or prophesies with the head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. So notice the activity that's happening in the worship service, prayer and prophecies, prayer and prophecies. So they're, they're praying um, to the Lord in public prayer. They're prophesying, which is that speech to edify and encourage the congregation as God speaks through them. But notice, if a man does it with his head covered, he dishonors his head. You know, what in the world does that mean? Well, who is man's head? It's Jesus. So he doesn't honor, dishonor his own head, so to speak, the reflexive way of saying that. He dishonors his head, which we just learned, the head of man is Christ. Men wore head coverings in the Roman religious practices. Um, it says this in the ESV Study Bible, Paul's point in this verse, Roman men sometimes practice the custom of pulling the loose folds of their toga over their heads is an act of piety in the worship of pagan gods. So if a man wears a head covering, that was tantamount to placing himself under the authority of somebody other than Jesus, thus dishonoring his headship, Jesus Christ. And so a man is to come in with his head uncovered that he answers directly to Jesus for everything under his care, under his authority. Another problem was that the social elite in that day, the men in particular, would wear their head coverings to show their authority in society. So imagine if a guy that had authority out in the world came into the church wearing his head covering, and all the other guys in the church would be made to feel inferior in his presence in God's house, where his people are to be treated on the equal level of children of God. And thus, that would cause divisions. And so, another reason behind the head covering issue. Now, both of these scenarios don't really exist in our culture. But for the woman, it says that if she prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, she dishonors her head and who is her head, her husband. So again, we're talking about wives and husbands. So this would be a serious wound to the husband in this honor-shame culture. If a wife 
wanted to make the world know that she was married, she would wear a head covering. You know, she was um, a woman and she was promised to another. She's in a marriage covenant. It would be kind of like today if a woman wanted to go out with her friends or go out shopping or even go to work and before pulled off her wedding ring and set it aside and took off. How do you think the husband would feel? You know, and so in the same way um, here, if the wife takes off the covering, it's like the wife saying, um, I'm shaming my man. You know, I'm setting him aside. I'm not respecting him in my life. But in the same way, there was the cultural elite among the men. There were the cultural elite among the women. And in the Roman culture, the culturally elite women, if you've ever seen like those pictures of Roman society, you know, the women do not have head coverings. Their hair is flowy and long. Um, the elite would often uncover their head, thus drawing attention to themselves. And we'll see why that is, is a distraction, especially in church in that time, uh, in, a, in a moment. But that would cause not only other women to feel inferior, but possibly set them up to dishonor their husbands according to their cultural understanding. In verse 6, For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is, a disgrace, it is disgraceful for a woman to cut her hair, or shave her head, let her cover her head. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why it was a distraction to have long hair, is because long hair was a symbol of a woman's sexuality. <laughs> you know? So guys get turned on by whatever women choose to expose. You know, like if in the old days, like if they expose their ankles, guys would get crazy about ankles, you know? <laughs> it's just the way guys are wired. And in that day, hair was considered a, something tied to sexuality, and so you would cover it in modesty. It was for the husband to enjoy. Um, so you can see how uncovering the hair actually was considered sexually revealing. And culturally, it signaled to other men that they were sexually available. And because of this, prostitutes would go around with their heads uncovered. They were sexually available or their heads shaven. So it was a cultural issue that revealed the nature of the heart, an outward thing that showed what was going on in the inside. And a lot has changed since then. Thank the Lord, right? Um, a lot has changed since then. But in that context... It was definitely distracting during worship service if a woman let down her hair in the sight of all. So women would wear a veil or a shawl to cover their hair. So in, this is an argue, argument from headship of authority that we've been looking at. But there's another argument. Propriety from observing order in creation. And so let's check this out in verses 7 through 12. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image of, and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Okay, there's a lot of weird stuff in there, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. But notice, again, to remind you, Paul is setting up a theological reason behind the tradition. And so he turns to creation as one of his proof texts. Man is to worship God in a way that shows that he's directly relating to him, that he's directly under his authority. And so if he's God's representative to his wife and family, if he's the pastor of his home, um, if he's to represent God in such a way, he's, he's not to cover his head. But understand this. Both man and woman were created in the image of God. In Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Both 
in the image of God. But Paul does say this, woman is the glory of man. Woman is the glory of man. Now, it probably refers to one who shows the excellence of another. Basically, the idea is the wife makes her man look good. <laughs> and that is more true than you know, guys. Her character makes the husband look good. In Proverbs 31, again, this Proverbs 31 woman in verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. The implication is, why? Because of her character. He is known. How cool is that? Well, let's look at the creation account to get a feel for all that Paul is talking about. Um, in Genesis 2.18, we see the story of the creation of man and woman. And it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man. <laughs> because she was taken out of man. Okay, so that's what Paul is talking about. That woman was made from man and made for man. Um, so made from man. This is why her quality of character points to her husband's excellence. Taken from his rib. So in the marriage relationship, that is a picture of what it looks like. Though man was made from dust as the source material. Woman was made from man as the source material. So God used Adam's rib. Not a toe, <laughs> pinky toe, or not, you know, an eardrum, but a rib from his side. But when it says that woman was made for man, understand, woman was not created to please man, but to make a complete set of man. Like all the other species in that story, you know, everybody had the complete set, man, woman, you know, salt, pepper, <laughs> all the complete sets that we think of in our world. Um, it just doesn't work when you don't have the other part of the set and God made man complete with woman. God didn't create multiple wives for Adam to rule over, but he created a wife that he can become one with, that they would be united and as one. In Genesis 2.24, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So just as Christ is equal with God the Father, so woman is equal with man. Eve was called Adam's helper. Adam's helper. Without her, he couldn't fulfill God's purpose for him. Only together could they fulfill God's purpose. They became partners together in maintaining God's creation. And so that's the backstory. And Paul said wives ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. And that had multiple purposes in that day. Number one, it fulfilled cultural norms, what people expected in that society if you were married. Number two, it solved problems in the dynamic of the church service to not cause distractions. But it also was an outward sign of the inward heart of a wife who put herself under her husband's authority. 
But how much better is it to live out the heart than to have an outward tradition that says that this should be true? You know, and that's sometimes the, the thing that happens with tradition over time is we forget the heart behind it and therefore the tradition becomes the distraction and we forget the main thing. And that is what we find in Ephesians 5.33, the, the purpose of marriage. You know, ultimately marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. You know, it's one of God's great object lessons to the universe. Picture between Christ and the church. But in Ephesians 5.33, it says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so here's that nugget of truth that is true for all times in all cultures. It's part of God's design. And then Paul throws in a weird phrase. Because of the angels. Ah, because of the angels. You guys know what that means, right? Well, commentators disagree on what that might mean, but I'll share with you an idea that makes sense to me. Paul points out that there are heavenly beings present when we worship. You know, angels really dig worship. That's why they were created. There's a worship service of God's people. Angels are there. It's not the first time in the Bible that it uses the motivations of angels being there or the idea of angels being there as a motivation to obey God. So Paul uses it here as a motivation to have order. But also there's another place that it's used as a mo motivation. In 1 Timothy 5.21, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels. Notice that. He's calling them to accountability before the presence of God, the presence of Jesus, the presence of elect angels. I charge you to keep the, these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality or favoritism. So angels, watch what's going on in worship. They actually are watching the church in Ephesians 3.10 so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly places. God's love for you, his grace toward you as a sinner. The angels watch that and they learn about God's kindness, love and forgiveness, long suffering, all sorts of things. Angels are also ministers to Christians. In Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. But also, angels visit sometimes without us knowing it. In Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show partial or <laughs> do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Crazy, right? So that brings us back to what Paul said because of the angels. Because they're present during worship, that makes our propriety in worship even more important. If others don't notice something unfitting in the worship service, I can guarantee you angels do. Why? Because angels had the role of being guardians of God's holiness guardians of God's created order. And so worshiping the Lord and honoring him as holy was something that they made sure was kept pure and free from anything that would take away from the glory of God. So they did not take worship lightly. They still do not take worship lightly. And sometimes we do. But when we know that there's beings in our midst that are like, no, this is big time, serious stuff. Come on little humans. Get right. Hebrews 12, 28 says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So realize that your heart attitude in worship impacts your relationship with God. It impacts the people 
sitting near you, and it impacts angels that are in the midst of the worship time. Well, there's some other theories about that that I won't get into today because I think it'll just be way too distracting. So in verse 11, Nonetheless, in the Lord, the woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. I love this because Paul, he says, nevertheless, he's he's like not wanting this tradition to be misinterpreted or to be taken way too far. Both men and women are created with equal value, and they're dependent on one another. The woman was made from man. Man now is born of woman. And so he's like, don't get too haughty, dudes. You know, chill out with the pride and, and realize with humility your role before God to take care of your wife. So we see the importance of women here in creation and family and church and God's kingdom and all of that. So Paul is not teaching that, and he's trying to protect it from going to that point. But with regards to salvation and our relationship with God, check this out in Galatians 3:28, it says, "There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus." Praise the Lord that he takes down any walls of division or differences between any of us, and we are one before him. You know, in heaven, gender is going to take on a new reality. I can't tell you what that is, because I don't know. But I do know, Jesus said that we'll not be given over in marriage anymore. There won't be a reason for reproduction anymore. And so, No longer will you be concerned about these areas of order. There will be a whole new order in the new creation. So what does that look like? I don't know. Maybe for women, this is a comfort. And you're like, praise the Lord. I should have never said yes. No. (laughs) But for men, hey, man, this is a wake-up call. Not only your future accountability, but where are you going to be on that day? How you serve now has an impact on that future. But for now, we're still part of the first creation, and this is God's order for here. So that we look forward to a different paradigm, right now, this is God's paradigm. This is his order. So we seek to live in obedience to it. So the last thing we see is propriety from observing the order of society. And he goes on, judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Um, Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, is it a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is to her glory, for her hair is given to her for covering. So he says, does not nature teach you? He speaks of the natural observation that helps us to determine someone's gender by looking at them. There are you know, some basic things. Even today in our world where women can have short hair, men can have long hair, you know, it doesn't mean you're a bad Christian or anything. Um, Again, this is tradition. This is a culture issue. But even today we can tell, you know, look at the signs we use for even the most basic person can understand the difference between which bathroom they ought to use because of the pictures, you know? So it's like, that's what Paul's saying here. Doesn't nature itself teach you, you know? You should just be able to kind of know what is a guy and what is a girl. Um, the general opinion of whom, human society or whatever culture you're living in. Um, and then there's some created things too, like guys can grow, grow these things. Most girls can't, but you know, guys can. Most guys can, I should say. Some guys can't. I'm not cutting on you if you can't grow a beard. But in those days, it was like, guys, grow your beard out. And um, they cut their hair short. And then, so Jesus, you know, didn't have long, flowy hair (laughs) in his culture. He he probably had short hair and a beard. And, um, you know, women were encouraged to grow their hair out long. 
But we don't live according to this culture in, or this tradition in our culture. Um, but we should not look to deny or devalue God's created differences in gender. And especially in the church, you know, I think we ought to encourage people in their gender as part of God, their God-created identity. You know, and as culture swings back and forth on the pendulum, you know, of going um, way too far on the gender issue is kind of where we're at right now. It's beginning to swing back towards the middle again. As men are winning women competitions, saying that they're a girl, and, <laughs> and society is now saying, hey, wait a second. You know, we have girls' sports for a reason. Dudes, get out of here, you know? Um, that's kind of what we're experiencing now. There are appropriate differences between the sexes, and we should acknowledge them and celebrate them, not lie to ourselves about God's order and creation. We should acknowledge and celebrate it, you know? Not, it's not loving to feed gender dysphoria. It's more loving to point out to people that their creator had a design. And so, essentially, in doing that, not only does it strengthen their identity before the Lord, but it also protects women from men taking over all their stuff. You know, not okay. Well, let's close with verse 16 here. It says, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Um, all of this, again, is to resolve distractions in the worship service. Um, these were Paul's spoken expectations and rules for the church of that time. And he says, don't be contentious about it. Because we, we don't have any other practice, which this word practice means a custom or common practice, a pattern of behavior more or less fixed by tradition and generally sanctioned by the society. And those kind of things are okay, and they bring order and protect from division. But notice what Paul's saying. Don't be contentious about whatever kind of tradition or order the church sets up. The last two years, we've seen what this looks like when it comes to masks and vaccinations, right? Different people have had different rules and there's been a lot of contention and judgment on one another for your stance on these things. And Paul's like, you know what? That, I don't want that in the church. I don't want this to, to distract. You know, if, you're, if your church decides to wear masks, then wear masks to honor the leadership that made that decision. Or if they say not to, then um, don't wear masks in honor, honor of that leadership, you know? Um, whatever it may be. But there are also areas of authority in your own home where you got to make these decisions on yourself. So, when it comes to head coverings in that day, Paul's like, hey guys, if you're going to come to church, we're, we're agreeing on this together. Don't make it an issue of division. Let's come together, let's worship the Lord and make him our focus. So should we return to the practice of head coverings? No, that's my answer. So we won't be wearing them next week. Um, <laughs> But we discern what God is teaching us today in this passage. You know, let's take time to just ponder that for a second. Propriety in worship is still important. So what does that look like? Well, number one, the focus of our gathering is to give glory to God. To give glory to God. You know, if traditions get in the way, then they need to go. So that we can return to the core issue of worshiping God from our heart in spirit and in truth. But also in giving glory to God, unity in the body is so key that we come together with sometimes unspoken rules and we just say, yeah, okay. I prefer to shout amen during the pastor's sermon, which you're welcome to, by the way. But if you did, you know, you might feel out of place because you don't see anybody else doing that. But unity helps bring 
glory to God because it takes away the distraction from your, placing the attention on yourself. And that's our second point. Place your attention upon Jesus and others instead of yourself. It's hard to not be focused on yourself when you come to church. I mean, you come in and you're like, okay, my breath smell all right. Um, where am I going to sit? I hope somebody says hi to me today. You know, I hope the pastor doesn't go as long as he's going right now. Uh, you know, we, we think about ourselves a lot, but what if we put Jesus first and others first? And then lastly, meet with God personally and worship him from the heart. From the heart. And that's what you'll notice we value here, you know? We don't put a lot of emphasis on outward things, but the heart is what we focus on. And that's our value. So protect the attention and focus of your heart during worship, because not only does it matter to you, and your kids are watching you, and God is watching, and the angels. So meet with God personally, worship him from the heart, because that, man, when you leave here, and you've done that, you know, you leave fed and fulfilled. So anyway, let's pray. God, we thank you for this passage, even though it's, it's a tough one. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take away the things that you want us to hear today, to be encouraged by today, to be challenged by today. But Lord, overall, we pray that as we go through this whole section, we would learn more about what worship looks like. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.